Oh, listen. Let's go ahead and turn it on. Yeah, okay. That means I have to change the network. You, you would do what? I have to change your phone to this Wi Fi. Oh. Well, don't do it now. No. Now, she's not in the picture. Okay. That may be in that picture. You'll see later. I got her. Hey. I got her in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here in Yucca, Arizona, First Southern Baptist Church. Uh, if you're tuning us in here tonight, uh, we've been studying the book of Zechariah, and tonight we're on the 14th chapter. And I'll tell you, if you want to tune back in next week, we're going to go from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 14, putting Zechariah in perspective from 1 all the way through 14. And it, you're going to be surprised it tells a very interesting story, rather than just the little bits and pieces that we, we pick up when we, well, not bits and pieces, but, uh, but it'll be interesting just seeing how the book of Zechariah grows as it goes, okay? So we are on the last chapter, but it was not the last time we'll be into Zachariah next week. We will go from 1 to 14. But do read with me uh, my Roman numeral number 1. Oh, by the way, if you're on Facebook, you can download these five pages. I've got five pages tonight because I've put a lot of pictures in. That was for Barbara. She was not even here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Levit Leviticus 23 outlines a seven-month spiritual year for the nation Israel. In this spiritual year, there are seven feasts, and these are also called appointed times. These are times when God has promised that he will show up, okay? Four of these feasts were fulfilled in the year of 30 AD, assuming that was the year, of course, that Christ went on the cross. Uh, those, those, uh, those four that were fulfilled in 30 AD would have been beginning with Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, Festival of First Fruits, then a 50 day span between the Festival of First Fruits and Pentecost. So those have all been fulfilled. These three feasts, I'm sorry, the remaining three feasts come in the seventh month and they are not yet, have not yet been fulfilled. These three feasts come at the end of the age, at a time that's not far off uh, into our distant future. Yes. On the final day of this seventh month period of time, the final day uh, is the Feast of Trumpets. Okay? Uh, not, there's a typo here. What? That's wrong. The first day. On the first day of seventh month. Everybody mark their. On the first, on the first day of the seventh month is the Feast of Trumpets. It comes on Tishri 1. Okay? Uh, trumpets sound in Israel to tell people something. Okay? In this case, that something is, is called Yom Kippur, or we know it as the Day of Atonement. That comes 10 days later. On that day, people were to mourn and afflict their souls. In other words, they were to repent of their sin. They were look, to look into themselves and say, wow, I'm a mess. I need something from God here to set me straight. These both are, are then those both sins. Happen in Tishra? What's that? They both happen in the same month? Yes. Okay. Tishri is the final month of the seven year period of time. So that first day of the and the first day of Tishri, blowing up horns. Bah, 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 bah. Okay. Horns tell you something, or trumpets tell you something. That, that, fest, that feast is called the Festival of Trumpets. Now, trumpets can tell you different things, but basically it's to, hey, uh, wake up, go to battle, uh, judgment is coming. In this case, 
the horns would be, the trumpets would be saying judgment is coming. And they know that the next 10 days later will be on the court. Now, those sins that they would realize on Yom Kippur would be placed on a lamb, goat, small animal. Of course, we've all heard about the scapegoat that goes out into the wilderness and yeah. that whole story. I don't, that happens on Yom Kippur and because their sins are transferred to an animal. Uh, and when that happens, they would experience momentary forgiveness. Okay? Actually, it really wasn't forgiveness. It was momentary atonement. Their sins were covered. Atonement. The word atonement means covered. So uh, they would they would have momentary forgiveness of being covered. Their sins would be covered. Now, the nation of Israel has never, ever experienced total forgiveness because they rejected the Messiah. Each and every one of us in this room, we have experienced total forgiveness. All of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven to us. We have total forgiveness in our life. But Israel doesn't, and Israel can't get it, because Israel, uh, as a nation, I'm not talking about... Hasn't accepted Christ. Hasn't accepted Christ. And now all they have to look forward to is judgment. Okay? The last celebration of Yom Kippur to them will be a day of judgment. People get that confused, thinking that the Day of Atonement was the day their sins were paid for. No, the Day of Atonement was the day their sins were covered up until the next time they have a Day of Atonement, which is one year apart. Uh, Zechariah chapter 11 instructs the Good Shepherd, we're going back about three chapters now, uh, the Good Shepherd to feed the flock for the slaughter. Remember that one? Because the flock, because to the flock, the good shepherd was only worth how much? 30 pieces of silver. Therefore, then we go into chapter 12 of Zechariah, tells of a burden, which means judgment, a judgment that would befall Israel. When's it going to befall Israel? In that day. Okay? This is all just kind of a review. Uh, and in that day, the people will mourn. That's what people are to do on the Day of Atonement, on the festival of Yom Kippur. So you can see how we're moving through from the coming of the Christ and his first coming, and now we're on to Yom Kippur. Yom, Jesus came first to be the Passover lamb. That happened in the fall. Passover happens in the fall, on the first full moon of the, of, of the month of uh, Nisan. So that that was the first festival. And that's when the sins were paid. Now we're all the way to the end of the spiritual year. Now we're in the seventh month. Okay? And that happens, by the way, in the fall when there's less light. I love the way God put this all together. Now in that day. In that day, and that day will be a seven-year period of time of tribulation. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a seven-year period of time. In that day, there's a term again, people will mourn when they realize that they killed the Messiah. And they will look upon him whom they pierced. That's in chapter 12. This happens, of course, when Jesus returns to earth to establish a millennial reign. With hearts in mourning, they will realize that Jesus suffered the wounds in his hands like his friends. Remember, they ask him, where did these wounds come from? In the house of my friends, he said. And we did a whole thing, was it last? No, week before last, about that scripture uh, was intended for false prophets. And that's exactly what they executed Jesus for. So they treated him as a false prophet when he was really telling the truth. Tonight we will see that Jesus will put an end to that tribulation and the aggressive armies of the whole world. He will put his physical feet <coughs> on the Mount of Olives, the very place from where he departed, where he ascended 2,000 years earlier. Remember the, the angel standing there and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stare up into into the heavens. Don't you know that this same Jesus will come in a like manner? Now they were talking, I think, about him coming in the clouds, Georgie. But he's going to come in the clouds. He's going to come right back to the exact same place <coughs> where he left. 
He will then turn the rugged terrain. This is kind of cool. You're going to learn some stuff you probably didn't know tonight. He will then turn the rugged terrain of, of Israel into an, into an inhabited plain. He will rule from the throne of David, and one third of the inhabitants will enter into the messianic year, and they will experience at that time total forgiveness. Once they're in the, the bosom of Jesus Christ, they will experience true and total forgiveness. The forgiveness that occurred at Passover when Jesus died will then be applied to Yom Kippur. Does that make sense to everybody? The I'm going to read that again. The forgiveness that occurred at Passover when Jesus died. That's what they're going to have to accept. Is Jesus and the Paschal Lamb. <clears throat> will be applied to them. Will be applied to Yom Kippur. For one third, forgiveness will trump judgment. Okay? So Jesus will take one third of Israel out of the Great Tribulation. We covered that last week. <coughs> so we're saying one third of an inhabitant, so we're assuming that they're all Jews? Yes. These are we're talking about Jews. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, and there's gonna be millions of people left on planet Earth. I understand yeah. that, but this is only affecting Israel or the Israel. 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 Yeah, they keep saying Jerusalem, but they actually mean and every so often they'll come back and they'll say uh, Jerusalem and Judah. And they, when you see Zach Ryan, he puts Judah right. in there. He's right. talking about all of Israel. That's kind of misleading. <clears throat> and it's one third of the one third of the Jews who are re, who are residing in Jerusalem at that time. Those will be the uh, Christian Jews. Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There's a Christian Jew is. Well, he's still a Jew, but yeah. Paul goes into saying it. He says, "Hey, to be a, to be a Christian and a Jew is the best of two worlds." Well, but if, if they if they um, convert after the rapture, then they're, they would they're, they're still they're called they're called a they're still tribulation. yeah the tribulation saint. But if they're Jewish, they have a good chance of getting in uh -huh. because uh, at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. And that's basically what we're studying now tonight. This has been kind of a, of a review. However, as Zechariah does, he goes back, and then he goes forward, then he'll go back, and then he'll go forward. So uh, stay with me. It's the same roller coaster ride that we've had through Zechariah from the very beginning, but it, it always moves kind of one step back, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward. Tonight we're going to get to the total in the game of Zechariah. <clears throat> which culminates, of course, in the establishment of the Millennial Kingdom. Um, read with me now. We're going to go back two or three steps <coughs> to the prophecy. Zechariah 14, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. That is that term, in that day. is the day that we're talking about. It's called the day of the Lord. It's also called the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So it's not a good time. And when you add the word burden to it and uh, apply it to your life, you're going to be going through some literal hell. Because it's going to be a time we read more about it in the book of Revelation of course, but they didn't have the book of Revelation back then, did they? No. And your spoil will be divided in your midst. Okay? They're talking about anything that Israel has is going to be divided, it's going to be taken from them. By who? By their aggressors. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Not a real good not a good prophecy uh, if, if you're sitting there in Jerusalem and you haven't accepted the Christ and you might have had an Ezekiel war already. I don't know. I don't have it. Nobody can pinpoint ex exactly when and you've, when the Ezekiel war is going to be. But you might have seen God's hand at work in the Ezekiel war. 
but you still didn't repent. You still didn't accept the Messiah. You just, God, God did this. But remember, we're talking about them accepting Jesus. The Jews believe in God. We're talking about them accepting Jesus as Messiah. <clears throat> I wrote, there are many times in Israel's history when God intervened and miraculously protected Israel. Um, they might have already done it many times. Let's talk about the Red Sea. Let's, let's talk about uh, all the times and the battles that they had getting from through the Promised Land. Time after time after time, I believe that they did it in the uh, 1966 war. Uh, uh, was it 66? 67. 67, yes. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of stories, miracles. And so God protects us, does in some way, shape, protect his people. However, however, the tribulation was not brought on by God, but rather allowed by God. Remember, Israel chose, I'm going to say that again, Israel chose the Antichrist. The Antichrist brought them to tribulation. The, okay. Remember, he was the foolish shepherd. If they had followed the good shepherd, but they didn't follow the good shepherd. The consequences of following the foolish shepherd are devastation and tribulation. In the verse above, we see Israel's travail. However, we shall soon see the God of Abraham strengthening his people in their battle in that day. So the battle is going to come to them. The devastation is going to come to them. The ravishing of their of the city, uh, they're going. Half of them are going to be uh, captured. Now, it's not a pretty picture. And you got to say, well, wait a minute. God's protecting these people. Uh, to some degree, he, he's not going to let. He's not going to let the remnant be destroyed. God has a promise to keep to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and down through the years, God has always kept that promise. Why did God go back into Israel to get the people out of Israel? Why? Because if you go back into what we studied about Abraham or Moses, he went back because of the promise that he made to Abraham. God will always keep his promise. <clears throat> Zechariah 3 through 5. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, See, I got a big picture over there? I don't know if he's going to be a giant or not, I think. But this was sort of descriptive. Uh, and that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. I'm going to stop there for a minute. I want you to get this picture. Jesus is coming back. Okay? He's the Messiah. We have this other picture right here, of which we're very familiar with, because it's, it's a revelation picture, right? Where Jesus is coming and his army is with him. He's coming down. But this is a picture that, that the Jews have, that Jesus, the Messiah, will come back down. He will step foot on the Mount of Olives and... And this is Zechariah talking. He's going to cause an earthquake to occur. And it's going to cause a great rift in, in the ground. Has anybody ever been to a, an earthquake site and seen, seen what earthquakes can really do? I mean, we've had a major earthquake. It's amazing. Sometimes those earthquakes can, can have a span of you know, a mile or better. You're, you're driving through some places on the San Andreas where it is stretched out for a mile cavity. Well, this is just the start. Of it. This is just the start. Of it. God is going to make a a valley. He's going to have a valley. What's happening back here in Jerusalem on page one was half of the city was in captivity. That meant there was half of the city that was not in captivity. They were still fighting, but they were about ready to lose the battle. So here comes Jesus. He's coming down. He's going to fight for him. But the first thing he's going to do, it says, then you shall flee through my mountain valley. He's making a valley for them. 
Does that sound familiar to anybody? I mean, you, you ask you ask my my great grandchildren uh, if they've heard of the the Red Sea, and you know they may not. I don't know. But I mean, they don't have to be too old to have heard of the Red Sea. But here it is in Zechariah. God is doing the exact same thing. Uh, in He's going to take a mountain. He's going to split it in half, and it's going to be right there where the people can get to it. It says, "Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal." I don't know where Azal is. Yes, you shall flee. As you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. I did a lot of research trying to find out what that earthquake was in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And there's no real description of the earthquake, because this is supposed to be similar. Uh, it's just the prophet Amos spoke regarding the earthquake uh, when King Uzziah was on the throne. And there's, so there's a mention of it in the Bible, but there's no real proof as to what earthquake that in is. Amos. Uh, it's in Amos, yeah. Uh, Amos chapter 1, I believe. Um, Thus says the Lord, my God will come and all the saints with you. That's where I stopped. <clears throat> Who's all these saints that are going to be coming? That's right. Although, read some commentaries, you'll find there's a lot of people that say, no, these saints refer to angels, you know. So, you know what I, I don't like to do is always take somebody else's opinion. I'd rather do the research, make my own opinion, and then tell you guys I'm right. So. <laughs> Yeah, let's take a look at the saints, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, first, let's read to you. I said something. That to In that day, Jesus will return to the very spot where he has ascended into heaven, the Mount of Olives. From the moment he arrives, cataclysmic events begin to happen. The very mount upon which his feet stand will experience a large earthquake and split the mountains in half, causing a very large valley. Through this valley, Zechariah says, you shall flee. The city of Jerusalem was under siege, and the you are the inhabitants. Notice that they are to flee through, quote, my mountain valley. God takes personal responsibility for the creation of a valley through which the remnant of Israel will be taken into safety. Like that, do the words Red Sea come to mind? Once again, God miraculously parts the elements of this earth, yeah. making a causeway for his people's escape. It's exact same scenario. Here they are completely uh, engulfed by the enemy. There's absolutely no, no way out. Does anybody remember what the word salvation means? <clears throat> anybody? Exchanging places. Sort of. It's, it's the moving of places. It's, it's changing the place. It's like Alice does every other week. Like moving she, furniture. she moves her furniture around. Okay. Don't do that. You don't know. Because I told you not to put that plug in the middle of the room. <laughs> now you're stuck. Yeah, you're it was a stuck. plan, Wayne. It was a plan. She's <laughs> but, but that's what it is. And here they, here they were at the Red Sea had no way to go. They had the enemy in front of them, a Red Sea behind them, and there was there was no way out. Moses lifted up his, his staff, and he said, Behold the salvation of the Lord. What he's saying in Hebrew, Behold, God's going to move things around. Yes. Okay. He's going to change the scenery, if you will. And that's what the word salvation means, is God's going to change whatever it is that's about to kill you. He's going to change your circumstances. He's going to change your uh, location. He's going to do whatever it takes to get you out of there and get you to safety. That is salvation in its root form. Okay? Now, this is what he's doing here. He's taking out these people, and he's taking them to safety. A lot of people believe that uh, this valley, we don't know, the earthquake hasn't happened, but it leads right to, it says, my mountains, 
a lot of people believe that he's taken him to the uh, mountains so of Petra. Petra. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, there's no real proof for that in the Bible, but uh, it's it's a good good place to hide. There's a lot of speculation. A lot of speculation, yeah. And <clears throat> where he's going to take him, I I think I think he could stand there. Uh, right in the midst of all the <coughs> fire and the bullets and everything, and just protect whoever he wants. Yep. And he's kind of like yeah. Superman, who just bounce off his chest. And, and Jesus, I mean, uh, God split the rock for Joshua. That's right. Yeah. There's been, and he, he split the um, he split the jar. He, he forded the Jordan River as well. So there's been a lot of cases where God has has stepped in. And done miraculous things with the earth. There is some Water. footage of the earthquake in San Francisco that shows the devastation from the earthquake. And I think that was 1909 or something. Right. Yeah. So I mean that that shows the devastation. What it's going to look like. Well, the research I did on the, the one in Uzziah the king, Uzziah the king's day, uh, speculation was that, that earthquake was an eight point something. So yeah. it's a major. Major earthquake. So this is going to be a major. This is going to, it's going to split. It's going to split a mountain yes. in half. So it's going to be a major That's earthquake. Bigger than eight. Yeah. This is <coughs> um, now, also note that when Jesus places his feet on the Mount of Olives, there are others with him. All the saints are with you. I believe that these saints are you and I, as you guys all raised your hands. And we now have two pictures of the return of Christ. Look up here. This is the one we're familiar with, right, right above, the Jesus riding on the horses. That's the picture we get out of Revelation. He's coming down. He's riding on a white horse. Uh, all the saints are right behind him. But the one up top is Jesus. At some point, he's going to get off the horse. Yep. Okay. And when he does, he's he's right there at the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't know where we're standing. I don't know where the saints are going to be housed or this earthquake, but we're all protected because we're there with Jesus Christ. And by the way, remember, if we're coming from heaven, we are in our glorified body. Say we're out of time. So <coughs> we're not even in real time. Right, we're not even in real time. No. No. Although I, I, think I think when he comes he down, he'll, he'll be, we'll be in time, but we'll be in Physically, we'll, it'll be time. Yeah. The bullets are firing at you, we'll be in time. But your body, you're, you're out of time. That's right. And it's, what he was getting at is that when I teach on a lot, how could Jesus walk through walls? Right. Okay. And because he was, had a physical body, right. he, could he, could fish, fish he could do all the things. But uh, if I want to go from here to there, I can't do it right now because i got a table in my way. But it wasn't here earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if time meant nothing to me, this was placed here in time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think there's a, a, a protection in there uh, that we have when we're in our glorified bodies that we don't have at this point. And I've got some notes here. In Revelation 17, 12 through 14, okay, I want to read this to you. Also note, okay. oh, here we go. The ten horns, which you saw, are the ten kings who have received. This comes out of Revelation. Which, which you have have received no kingdom as yet, but they received authority for one hour as kings with the beast. This is Revelation we're talking about. But it's the same battle. It's the same battle. These are of one mind, and they will give power and authority to the beast. Who's commanding the armies in this battle? The beast. Okay? But not, not in Zechariah's terms. Okay? Didn't uh, Daniel also talk about that? Well, yeah, this, Daniel talked about the beast. Uh, and Revelation calls them these. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. That's got to be about the best description <coughs> of the church that we could give. We are both called, we are the called out ones. Uh, Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I don't know if I want to hang on faithful or not, but any faithfulness we have has been imputed to us through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So we are the call, the chosen, and the faithful. And we are the ones who are with the Lamb. 
as seen in Revelation 12, uh, Revelation 17, 12 through 14. <clears throat> now, if you get to Revelation 19, this picture here. <clears throat> and the armies in heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Every picture of a saint who goes to heaven is a picture of someone who is given a white robe. Yes. So we can pretty much assume that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. That if we are, uh, he's bringing with him this this army of people. By the way, we're, we're not really a fighting army. We're yeah. just there for prayer, uh, moral support. I don't know what we're doing because we don't need anybody but Jesus. He's going to do all the work. Okay, he's going to do all the fighting. But <clears throat> we're there with him. <clears throat> you know why? The same reason that Sandy and I are always together. You know she's, she's my wife. Yeah, I really love her. Thank you. And, <clears throat> and we are the bride of Christ. In fact, the ra famous rapture scripture states, so shall we forever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You know? Uh, he's not going to take off on some thousand year campaign and leave us alone. You'd never go for that, would you? No. So we're going to be with him. Zechariah 14, <clears throat> 6 through 7. It shall come to pass in that day, there it is again, that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day. By the way, this whole thing is in that day. So this is a seven-year period of time we're talking about in that day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. In other words, what's supposed to be dark, it's going to be light. God's going to play... 24-7 uh, be daylight. 24-7 maybe dark. Okay? No. And then it says that it will be light. Okay, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. In other words, it's going to be light, but when it's supposed to be dark, it's going to be dark. And that's kind of what I got out of the scripture. When it's supposed to be, he's going to play, God's going to play havoc with the light of the earth. This little picture we found on the um, uh, internet, I like it because it's got a picture of the olive tree. You see the light that's in it? The light is diminishing. So on that day, the, the sower of light will no longer shine. Okay? In other words, it's going to be dark. And darkness is a form of judgment. I got this to say about it. There's a new sheriff in town, and that sheriff is the one who set the sun, the moon, and the entire universe into motion. I don't know how he did it, but he did do it. Now, as he arrives back on planet Earth, he begins changing the elements that light the sky. He's already split the mountains down the middle. Now he's going to change the way the Earth is illuminated. Kind of, he's just showing his power. He's flexing his muscles, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> you think that was a good trick? Wait till I take the sun out of the sky. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but I tend to think there's going to... Oh, that's better. Yeah, I, can get rid of the copy. <clears throat> I tend to think there's going to be more dark days than light days uh, because it is the burden of the Lord. It is a time of judgment. Even though God's there, it's the end of this period of time, but until the judgment is complete, uh, God is going to let them kind of go through it. Okay? It's during the seven years. This is at the very end of the seven years. Jesus comes back after all the bulls of wrath. He dropped his head. You don't need to drop his drink in this water. Thank you, Jim. You are welcome. Jesus is now going. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, here we go. Zechariah 14, 8 through 9. 
And in that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem. Here's another thing from that. Half of them toward the eastern sea, and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. We all know how the water gets to us. It snows in the mountains, melts down, comes down through the ground. <clears throat> it either goes down, hits the river, and floats out to sea. Or a lot of it goes way down into the ground and becomes uh, basically boulder <coughs> tanks, uh, like we have around here, pockets of water that you can drill down and get to, right? We all know what a spring is, uh, a place where the water pops back up out of the ground on its own yes. and just flows. Well, even even springs are seasonal. You know, most springs are seasonal unless they're fed from a very high mountain. Jerusalem is already on a high mountain. It's on Mount Mount Moriah. Uh, there's there's three four different mountains except that make up the Kidron Valley and the Valley of Jehoshaphat. They go. And, and Jerusalem and the, the Temple Mount all set on this high mountain. Yeah. Remember we talked to, on Sunday about that being the only high place that God ever allowed a human sacrifice. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's going to be two rivers. Two rivers flowing out of Jerusalem, right from the city. I've got some pictures of it here, but well, with the artist's conception of it anyway. Rivers flowing out, half of them toward the eastern sea, half of them toward the western sea, both summer and winter. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In other words, hey, he should, again, he's flexing his muscles. In that day it shall be, the Lord is one, and his name is one. Think about what, that, what it just said here. The Lord is one, and his name is one. Who's doing this? God. But what's the name we call that guy? Jesus. 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 They're seeing Jesus do this, and they're going, the Lord, using the L-O-R-D in Hebrew would be Jehovah is one, or Yahweh is one. And his name is one. They are calling now this man that they have mourned for, who they have uh, waited, for. waited for. They're calling him God. Somewhere I got it written in this. This is about the closest you're ever going to get in Old Testament theology showing the triunal God. Yeah. Although, if you look for it, it's, it's there. And we talked about it back when we... In the visions of Zechariah, where the uh, angel of the Lord was talking to the Lord of hosts. Yeah. Uh, so if you're looking for it, you can find it. This it just says right here. They're looking at him and they're going, "The Lord is one, and His name is one." It's kind of like a nugget. You'll find it. Mm -hmm. We we have even more manipulation of earthly elements now. Jerusalem sits in a mountain region, not in the middle of a fresh water port, but in these scriptures, Jesus will create living waters. Now, living waters, we know all know the story about Jesus saying, I will give you living water. Right. But that's not what this is. Okay. This is, this is this, okay. that's spiritual living water. This is moving water, fresh water that flows out and goes down into the ocean um, or into the seas. Um, <clears throat> living waters are fresh water that flows from deep springs. These waters will somehow flow from the city of Jerusalem into in two directions. One to the Mediterranean Sea and one into the Dead Sea. I bet it won't be dead after that. <laughs> yeah. They can put all that. Blood. You know, the problem with the Dead Sea, it has no uh, output. Yeah, yeah, just yeah, just it smells bad too. Yeah, it's a it's a collecting pool with no no place to get out. I bet that's all going to be fixed. I got a feeling it's just living water goes in there. Well, we're going to see everything going to be fixed. Also, these new rivers that flow from Jerusalem will flow year-round, summer and winter. See, it defies even where the water comes from. I personally believe that the source of these waters will once again, once again, be 
the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ. He's back. But he's not here to pay the penalty of sin for the whole world. He's here to rule. He's here to establish his throne. And all the inhabitants on earth will know that this is Jesus who stepped out onto the Mount of Olives. And he is Lord. Okay? He is God and his name is One. Okay? This is as close to any Old Testament scripture that describes the concept of Trinity as you're going to get. The people in that day will get a good look at the one that they pierced you want and they're going to continue to they actually killed god <laughs> can you imagine getting a picture hey hey i did something really bad today sandy i killed god that's they bad they didn't understand yeah. it <laughs> but they're understanding it now well yeah but the thing is that they were supposed to be so smart and tell the people all, but they didn't read what was in the scrolls. They're all a bunch of bad shepherds. Here, now here's another good one. All the land shall be turned into a plain. <laughs> we're not just talking about laying in the mountain. We're not just talking about creating massive rivers. Uh, we're talking about major things. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Giba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. I, I've seen maps of what all these places do. That's basically laying out all the land around Jerusalem. It's a huge parcel of land, kind of like we got pictured up here. An inhabitant uh, shall be raised up and, and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and to the corner gate and from the tower of Hanel to the king's wine press. I don't know where all these places are, but if you toured over there, it'd be nice if you could just lay that up. I'm told there are maps you can go around, uh, Zechariah maps, if you will, that uh, where people have. Well, isn't there some assumption about the, where all the gates are situated? Right. Yeah. If you get into, uh, but that's just the gates of the temple too. There's you have the day gates of the temple, and you got the gates of the, the city. city. And they're going to extend out the gates of the city because uh, they're talking about the city not just the temple now okay <clears throat> the people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction okay but jerusalem shall be safely inhabited jesus is now going to change the topography of the entire area if if you go to Israel today, go to the city of Jerusalem, you'll find that it's in a hill mountainy area. Like I, like I told you, they sit on mountains, uh, the city sits on in, in a mountainous area, and the highest point of that, of course, is the Temple Mount, well, Mount Moriah, and I should have looked up the elevation, but it, it's a mountainous area. And it's not what you think about when you think about Israel being all desert. It, it's, um, it's rugged. It's rugged terrain. And this is saying that they're going to level this thing out. And he's not going to do it with bulldozers. No. All of a sudden, something's going to happen. And it says, the land shall be turned into a plain from Yiva to Ramon. Isn't and, that going to happen when Jesus stands on it too? Yeah, I think it all is going to happen simultaneously. Mm. I think as Jesus comes back, he's going to start. He's going to set up his throne. It's not going to take take him like Alice and, and God where it took him a year to build their house. Okay, <laughs> he, He's going to go after it and he's just going to get it done. Of course, I'm still 13 years on my house. So. No, the Mediterranean and the uh, Red, or the, uh, Red Sea now all will be in a different place. I don't know about that. Well, but if it levels well, the plane, it's going to, it's going to, but you got to pick up on this one. It it. Okay, it's still going to be raised up. Okay. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place. So I, I see it as just a leveling out of all the different mountains that are around there. Okay. It's already made the valley where people escaped into some other mountains. Okay. We're not told which one, Rocky Catherine okay. or whatever. But, I think all the artists that I looked at, I liked this one the best here on the right. 
it, it's showing that it's setting up on a plane. It's yes. still elevated. It's got it's showing the river coming off this side. You can't see the the one going out the other side. Okay, and you see that it's it's an entire city. It's all laid out, and I like even the, the way they've got the tents laid out around the areas. You know, almost like they were in the in the desert or the wilderness. But I, I see it as a far bigger place than even what the uh, artists oh, yeah. are. So there we go. Okay. The area of Jerusalem today is a rocky mountainous terrain. Jesus, who is sitting up on his throne, is going to remodel the area. G Jerusalem will remain raised up. However, all the little hills and valleys will be made into one large plain. The reason for the remodel is so that the people can dwell in it. Note they have been living under siege for seven years. The state of Jerusalem was in utter destruction. So God's not going to go in there and start remodeling houses and all this. I mean, Jerusalem has been a war zone for the last seven years. Imagine what it must look like. But now Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Peace will finally rule in Jerusalem only because the Prince of Peace is now sitting on his throne. I get a picture of Jesus coming in and instantly, it's like when we parted the Red Sea, oh, yes. parted the mountains, and, he, and he's leveling out the plains, and I don't know if he's going to rebuild the houses or what he's going to do, but he's going to set up his kingdom. And by the way, what's going to remain standing is going to be the temple. Okay, The temple is going to be remain standing because that's where he's going to rule from. Or he's going to build himself a brand new temple. But I don't think it's going to take a long, long time for him to do it. Okay? Listen. Peace will finally rule in Jerusalem only because the Prince of Peace is now sitting on his throne. Now we're going to go back a step. Let's go back a step. That's what Zechariah does. He goes forward two, backwards one. We're going to talk about what's going to happen to those people that um, came against Jerusalem. You know, God uses people. God uses people. Uh, hey, do you remember Tim? Oh, everybody knows Tim. We, we ordained Tim. Uh, Tim Burns. Yes. Um, had a long talk with him today. We were talking about when I got fired out of the prison. You know, God uses people uh, to move people around, okay? When I got fired at the prison, Sandy and I were sad. We sat down and we cried. I mean, we'd given that prison system 20-some years of our life. And uh, what are you going to do with me now, Lord? There are six people standing outside the, oh, down over here by uh, the old school, or the school, wanting to hire us to come in here and, and take over the church to so what church you know? and uh, what they did have they had some of the people that used to be part of the church were out there with Don and some other people at, uh, in, the, in the desert at one place Walton Sue and all that. it was the same was the place was a mess and I, I was already sad enough without them offering me a job we didn't want it but, you were already moving to Oregon yeah we were ready to go to Oregon uh, I was going to come in here God had a different plan. Yeah, so I made a, a deal with, uh, with them that I would uh, do it only if everybody voted. Everybody voted and they wanted me to try it. Even then I said, I'll try it for a month. I don't think you told them that until afterwards. No, I, I told God that, yeah. I didn't tell them. I said, I didn't want to come in any kind of problems. I wanted a nice home. Anyway, but it's getting back to God use people in that prison to come against me. They were doing evil. We were called by the Lord to be there. And they lied. Yeah, they told lies and all kinds of stuff. Um, a lot of that. But God was wanting to move me. And uh, it all turned out to be a good thing. But uh, God gets even with people like that. Okay. Every one of the people, the nations that ever came against Israel, 
has suffered the consequence. And here, in this chapter here, chapter 14, 12 through 15, we're going to see what's going to happen to these people. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh will dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. Not a pretty picture. And their tongue shall dissolve in their mouth. Nuclear. A lot of people go there, but there's absolutely no proof to say that. But it, it's it's possible God because remember what God did with them. Remember what God did with the remnant. He got them out of there. Yeah. And it could oh, be. Oh, yes. And by the way, he can use what's here on this earth. People are shooting little nuclear bombs at each other. Who knows? How long does it take before they can go and pick up the bones? Well, in this scripture, we don't have that. In the Ezekiel War, you've got the seven years that it takes to purification. Yeah. But not necessarily here. Uh, it shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against, against his neighbor's hand. This is with the Assyrians. That's what God did with the Assyrians. And they all started fighting each other. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem. That's just another way of saying that all Jerusalem will fight. Okay? Or Israel. Judah is basically a synonym here for all Israel. Judah will also fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together. Here's, they're going to have gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. So such also shall be the plague on the horses, the mules, and the camels, and the donkeys, and all the cattle that will be in those camps. So shall this plague be. <clears throat> of course, you and I know that these horses, mules, and whatever aren't going to be horses, mules are going to be probably tanks and, and airplanes and whatnot. But nonetheless, they're going to be destroyed. And uh, we tried to find a picture of um, people whose flesh was dissolving. <laughs> we got into some pretty gross stuff on the internet. We started typing in pictures like that. So what we did find was this one here. And this picture here was described to us from Jesus. You can read the fine print here. Jesus referred to this time when he said, in Matthew 28, for whatever the carcass is, there will be the eagles. Eagles will be gathered together. Uh, Jesus was referring to this time, the great battle. And if you read the book of Revelation, uh, you'll see that this is, Jesus is talking about this battle, Zechariah is talking about this battle, and the killing of the people in this battle. But let me read what I've written here. In the book of Revelation, Apostle John describes Jesus' return in spiritual terms. He calls the leader of the armies of the earth a beast, and he describes the false prophets of Zechariah's day, chapter 13, as one false prophet. In, in, in the book of Revelation, John only refers to one person who is deemed the false prophet, and one Antichrist who is deemed the, the the beast, right? But it's the same same description of the same warfare. And in Revelation, I saw the beast and the kings and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. That line there correlates to what we studied last week about the false prophets. Jesus is going to clean house the false prophets. Remember that? These two were cast alive into the lake of fire with burning brimstone, and the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. John describes this simply as, as the rest were killed with a sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. Up here, Zechariah describes it almost like a nuclear blast, as you guys read. Nobody else would, do, would pick up on that back in the days of Zechariah. They called it a plague, okay? And here, here John is calling it the, the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him. He's talking really about his word, okay, from the mouth of him. And I said it a couple weeks ago, basically Jesus is going to say, die. If, if you, know, you no longer have breath. If, if he can say, hey, there's no more sun, he can certainly say there's no more life in you. 
Yeah. That, that's it. We all owe our life to Jesus Christ right now. We wouldn't wiggle without him giving us life. Wiggleability, if you will. I like that. <clears throat> when the Apostle John, no. Okay. <clears throat> oh, wait. These two were cast alive and were killed with the sword of his mouth. Okay. No. When the Apostle John describes how the armies were killed, he said they were killed with the sword of his mouth. In Zechariah, we talk, we are told it will be like a plague. Okay, also depicted in the defeat of the heathen forces, a picture of, of an army fighting against itself. Uh, the soldiers basically then turned on one another, just as they did back in the Book of Judges. I got the scripture here, Judges eight two. You can look that up. There's uh, several places in the Bible where armies come against Israel and God causes them to lose their minds and begin fighting against themselves. And that's another picture that's given. But for whatever reason, whatever reason, the end game is the same. They're all going to be lying there dead on the battlefield. And Jesus said, wherever, wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. In this case, the eagles are really vultures. Okay, not eagles, but vultures. Um, and it shall come to pass in that day that everyone who is left of all the nations will come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King of the King, the Lord of hosts, and keep what? The Feast of Tabernacle. I meant make I'm not making this up to fit with my opening. It says it right here. Okay. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts. On them will be no rain. If the, and it's just using Egypt as an example. If the families of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They, will, they shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the feast of the tabernacle. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the feast of the tabernacle. Let's well, put ourselves... I mean, ourself. Egypt's going to still be there. What's that? I mean, Egypt's still there. All the nations are still going to be there. Well, I mean, it's still going to be Egypt. Yeah. <clears throat> this world will be run from Jerusalem. <clears throat> there is... There is so going to be... If America is here, you'd have to The land is going to be here. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what kind of government or what's going to be Well, what I'm saying, the people that are still here would have to go over to the feast in Jerusalem. That's right. And how they're going to get there, I'm not sure, but God may make a causeway across the great oceans. I don't know how, they, how they're going to do it. Okay? <laughs> I don't know. But Jesus is ruling on the throne. He just showed us what he can do with a small little place like uh, like. Isn't there a new heaven and a new earth? No. Well, that's yeah. Yeah. No. Not for thousands of years. Okay. Yeah. And that's where we're headed. That's where we're headed. Now, that's what I want to talk to you about the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> First, I just want to cover this punishment thing. Okay. Right up to the day of the great white throne judgment. I don't want to have to get too involved in Revelation. Time is running short. Right up to that time, well, wait. until until God begins making this a new heaven and a new earth, just like what you're talking, about, which comes at the end of the thousand year millennium. This is the first part. I'm going to away. Right up to that point, mankind will be given the opportunity to repent. Remember, these people that are living here, other than than the tribulation saints and the church, they will all be in their regular sinful bodies, okay? Even the people that are serving in the temple, they haven't been translated yet, taken to heaven. They are actually doing things right in their, in the bodies in which we live to prove that, hey, it can be done, okay? They're not sinning, they're actually doing everything right. But everybody will have that opportunity to repent. Everything, everything else has been fulfilled. Yom Kippur came. When did Yom Kippur come? Yom Kippur came when they mourned. That's a picture of Yom Kippur. Yes. And they mourned. Now, this same picture of Yom Kippur is going to remain open right up to the very end of time 
once the people begin mourning that's another way of saying repenting at any point in time they can accept the true and living God the Christ and the blood of Christ okay because it's going to be taught from the temple and it's going to become mandatory now the, you say well how cruel could that be that God's going to still punish people just because they don't want to worship the way he wants to worship there's not going to be Confucianism there's not going to be uh, Allah and any other gods Okay, Th that's all out the window that's no not. confusion no confusion just, but guess what mankind don't like it and in the very yeah. end there's another big rebellion Satan is released from the prison I don't want to get too deep that's revelation but trying to explain why God is a loving God would punish people for not doing what he says. The same reason we punish Rowan and well, I never do. Uh, when Caleb does, uh, gets mad at Rowan and, and Madeline when they don't do what she says. Okay. <clears throat> Why? Because God wants them to be saved. That's God's yes. ultimate goal, is he wants them to be saved right up to that very last moment and the lion is satisfied and there was found no place for them as and the next scene is the great white throne judgment that all the dead are raised and there's right up to that point and that that of course is the ultimate judgment uh, and then right after that john looks and he sees a, a uh, new heaven and a new earth that's what you're talking about. Yeah. But let's read on. The armies of the world that came against Jerusalem all had family members and people who did not come with the fighting force. These people are considered survivors of the Great Tribulation. Some of these people will convert and will go up to Jerusalem to worship the king and to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. I find it interesting that even in the millennial reign of Christ, people will still keep the Feast of Tabernacle. This seems to be a requirement. And if people do not obey, they will be punished. Remember, this is the last feast to be completed. And I believe it is not fulfilled on this side of eternity. Okay. Even in the millennium, let us now look at what the Apostle John saw as a planet went into eternity. He saw a new heaven and a new earth. But a new Jerusalem. And from heaven, he heard a loud voice saying, what? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. This happens at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. We've not gone further than Zechariah went, okay? Thus a fair and loving God would want everyone to be looking forward to that day in eternity. Hence the requirement for all to observe the remaining feast of the tabernacle. Why are people struggling here today in this world? Because they didn't. They don't keep the Passover. Do we keep the Passover? Of course we do. Every time we acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Pascal lamb. Uh, do, we keep, do we keep the festival of first fruits or the festival of unleavened bread? Yes, we do. Every time we do communion, do we keep the festival of first fruits? Yes, yes we do. Every at Easter Sunday, do we, do we keep uh, the the Feast of Pentecost, yes we do, every time we speak with the Holy Spirit. So all these things that have been fulfilled, all these different feasts, and someday, if we keep the other feasts, okay, but, you know, we, we, get, we get out of this world just keeping those four, we're out. Yes. But the rest of the world, they won't have the risen Christ. Um, there's no church, let me put it this way. There's just Jesus on the throne, he's right there, they need to look forward to eternity. And eternity comes to planet Earth. In the prayer, we say it all the time. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on Earth as it is in heaven. Only a small portion of people were ever determined to live in heaven with God. That is the bride of Christ. Everybody else is determined to live on planet Earth. That's what it was created for, but it wasn't created for sin. Once the sin problem has been eradicated, mankind will dwell on earth. <clears throat> Let me finish up. In that day, I'm sorry, I'm going to move over here. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses, 
the pots, and the Lord's house shall be like the bowl before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem. Talking about cooking utensils, okay? Yes. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah, that's Israel, shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook them. Uh, sacrifices. Be it known, someday we're going to go back into it, I need to do a study from Ezekiel 40 through to the end, 48, where it talks about the reinstitution of the sacrificial system. We don't do it anymore, but it will be done, but it will be done more in the fashion in which we do communion, looking back onto the cross. Before the sacrificial system was looking forward to the cross. But Ezekiel has some interesting takes on, on the future worship from uh, Jerusalem. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of all. That's the last line written in Zechariah. I found it interesting that there's not going to be a Canaanite. Does everybody know what a Canaanite is? Someone came from Cain. Canaan. What cursed? There you go. Cain, Canaan, Canaan was cursed. Yeah. Was, the person who wrote that story, of course, was Moses. He was taking people to the land of Canaan. And he made an obvious uh, plan to let everybody know they're going to the land that God had cursed. Don't get me wrong, people. Hey, we're going to a land that God has cursed. And he's probably rallying the forces with that going. And that's that's a theme in the land of Canaan. It's called the promised land, but it was the land that God had cursed for the Canaanites. And God wanted them wiped out way back in the days of Moses. Yeah. But they stuck around and they infected his people. And they're still around to this day infecting us, the Canaanites. But in the end, no longer shall there be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord. No longer will there... When Jesus is ruling on the throne in Jerusalem, I'm not saying there's not going to be sin outside the camp, but in Jerusalem there will not be a Canaanite. There will be nobody there to infect Israel because Jesus will take them out. He's going to rule with an iron scepter. And if, if you're not on board with this program, you better go live in Egypt and pray that you're going to get some rain. Because we are now given the final picture to the throne of Jesus and how the city of Jerusalem surrounding that throne will look. Everything will look and be about holiness to the Lord. In the past and in the days of Zechariah, the priest wore turbans that had this same uh, inscription. Remember, we even studied it uh, a while back. Now in the city of Jerusalem and in Israel, which is Judah, everything, everywhere will be holiness to the Lord. And, and, from, and from the city that has experienced more warfare than any other place on earth will come this proclamation, holiness to the Lord. Israel will now serve the true and living God, and the book of Zechariah ends with the statement, in that day there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. That's in Jerusalem. That will be his house. Anything cursed is gone. And Israel will finally and Israel will finally oh, bad luck. Anything cursed is gone and Israel will finally get it right. Take that second Israel out of there. I was in the Russian government book. And Israel will finally get it. Kind of amazing. So goes the story of Zechariah. This man was a mighty prophet. A mighty prophet. And we a lot of people don't study the book of Zechariah, but they they throw out different scriptures, they don't even know where they came from. Kind of like, well, one day they'll all look and come in with tears or the, or the other line uh, about the 30 pieces of silver. A lot of things came from Zechariah. And next week we're going to, I'm going to write a paragraph each on each chapter. Kind of bring this back and we'll kind of walk through each. It's only 14, par 14 paragraphs next week. Okay. With lots of pictures. <laughs>
Pastor Doug, you want to pray us out of here? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for allowing us to study your word, Father. We ask that your word just gets put on our heart, Lord, so we understand it and become more like Jesus. We thank you for Wednesday night, and I ask for blessings upon each and every one of us here. Father, that your word richly dwells in our hearts and comes out of our mouth. We thank you for the time together, the fellowship together, and the learning of your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And the soup. And the soup.